Bill out, and I know it's always a danger to do so, but I'm going to run that risk uh, to single out uh, our dear friend Michael Baszler uh, and the work that he, would you join me? How about a thunderous ovation for Michael? His uh, very important work in, among other things, Holocaust uh, restitution. Uh, he taught here at Pepperdine and was just a tremendous uh, moral force as well as intellectual force for our students. We treasure our friendship uh, with him, and we know, Michael, you're not far away in Orange County, and so thank you. Uh, and uh, Michael, of course, was inspired to uh, create a program with the support of his then institution. He's now at Chapman that uh, uh, has brought Pepperdine more fully uh, and quite willingly and, and happily and cheerfully uh, into the orbit of very important uh, uh, issues that affect really global life, the global uh, polity. And so we're very grateful for the program at Bar Ilan and for Avi, as Avi, Avi is here. Uh, Avi Bell, our friend from Bar Ilan uh, in Tel Aviv, just outside Tel Aviv, has a great, great, even better than dear Alan Dershowitz, he has a really great, great arrangement. One semester at bar Ilan, one semester at the University of San Diego. Now, a late president of Pepperdine University, Norval Young, said famously within our little community, there is no competition among lighthouses. We need more lighthouses. So, Avi, there's no competition with USD, but why are you there as opposed to at Pepperdine <laughs> University? So we will be in conversation about that. But Pepperdine has been uh, privileged to participate through our colleague Sam uh, Levine uh, in what we call here the Michael Basler Program, a number of consortium of law schools. A number of law schools are involved in that. Avi has become a friend of the program and a participant in the program. Uh, in Tel Aviv and then especially on the uh, visits to, uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, and some of those issues will be before us uh, this morning. So, Bokrato, Michael, work on my Hebrew. My Hebrew is so weak. I didn't do well in Hebrew school. You know. what, what, uh, would you, was that all right? As we would get on the bus uh, in Tel Aviv and head out, Avi, you can see this, right? Picking up the students along the way. Uh, and then, Paul, you'll be more properly and fully uh, introduced uh, momentarily. Uh, but Paul joined the program uh, from Wayne State Law School. We're very delighted to have him participating uh, in it. But as we would motor along, picking up at three different stops, students participating in this marvelous Michael Basler program at Bar Ilan, I sat riding, as it were, if you can ride shotgun in Western style with Michael. And he was working with me on my Hebrew. But especially, so we should all now say, Michael, as we did on the bus th each morning in Tel Aviv, would you lead us? No, 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 no. That's not the way you did it. You did it with gusto, with elan. That's much better. So, Bokratov. We're really glad to have uh, each of you here. And now would you join me in welcoming my colleague, uh, Roger Alford, who's going to say another word. Well, it's my uh, great privilege to be here to uh, welcome all of you to this event, and it'll be a great event. Um, and uh, we have a, a wonderful schedule um, and, a, and an amazing uh, uh, list of panelists that we're going to, to be announcing. Um, this is a very unusual uh, conference because it really was uh, the vision of a student that wanted to do this. Normally when you have a conference of, of this magnitude and this size, it's the kind of thing that is, is faculty driven, but, but AOL uh, has is, is just been a phenomenal inspiration to, to doing this particular conference and uh, he approached uh, Ken in the early fall and, and Sam Levine and, and I and others and ever since then has been working diligently. Uh, I haven't asked him what his grades were in the fall um, but uh, I can tell you that he has been uh, quite an, an inspiration for me and for others and so I really do want to credit Eyal and, and the work that he has done to make this event happen. Um, as part of the discussion 
of what we wanted to do with this conference, I strongly recommended that we try to identify some international law topics that we would discuss, and then I suggested some possible names along with uh, other individuals that gave their input, and I'm just so thrilled with the group of speakers that we have with us today to be on this particular panel. Um, we wanted to have a perspective of international law with a particular emphasis on international law in the context of its impact on Israel, an issue that is of no in small moment because it is a topic that comes up over and over again on numerous different uh, uh, arrangements, specific substantive issues, specific uh, uh, individual skirmishes. It's an issue that comes up a lot, and it is also an, an issue that is frequently discussed in, um, in the literature, in the blogs, in the classroom. I, when I teach public international law, there are numerous, numerous references to issues related to Israel in the various casebooks. So this first panel that we're going to talk about is going to be a focus on international law and its relevance, uh, its impact on uh, Israel. Is it good for Israel? Is it bad for Israel? Um, and our speakers today, we have three speakers. Um, our, Avi, are you going first? Is that right? Yeah. Paul. Our first speaker, Paul Dubinsky, is a friend of mine, a personal friend of mine. We go way back, um, who um, uh, went to Yale undergrad, uh, did a uh, law degree at Harvard Law School, and did his LLM at Catholic University. He's an expert on private international law as well as public international law. He's an expert on civil procedure. Um, he uh, was a professor at New York Law School and is now a tenured professor at Wayne State uh, and is just a delightful individual. Uh, Avi Bell um, is well known to many of you, I think. Avi is uh, a very well known professor um, at Bar Ilan University and then as of recently at San Diego. Uh, he has also been a visiting professor at uh, Fordham Law School. And um, Avi is one of the most um, uh, strong and persuasive advocates for the state of Israel when it comes to international law issues. And I have uh, frequently enjoyed his writings, uh, both with respect to his professional writings in academic journals, as well as his, his quite vigorous defense of Israel in um, in the various public fora, including blog posts, including blog posts on Opinio Juris, which is one of the blogs that I participate in. Um, he is uh, very, very persuasive. Obviously, he does many, many more things besides just international law issues. He writes in many issues of administrative law and publishes extraordinarily well. But Avi is uh, a person that we're absolutely delighted that he is here to be speaking with us as well. Bruce Einhorn, who's coming in shortly, um, he is on his way. Uh, is, uh, has for years been a federal immigration law judge. Uh, he was there for 17 years. He's been an adjunct professor at Pepperdine uh, for much of that time teaching humanitarian law uh, and the laws of war. He recently became retired from the bench and became the director of Pepperdine's asylum clinic in which he focuses on, uh, in particular, religious liberty asylum issues, issues of, of uh, persons of faith who are persecuted because of their faith. And so we're just delighted to have Bruce with us as well. He a, has a, a bachelor's from Columbia and his law degree from New York University as well. So please welcome our three panelists. Should I just start? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, thank you, Roger, for inviting me and Dean Starr and all of you for coming uh, early on Valentine's morning on a Sunday. Um, I have to say, there, I, uh, there's so many reasons or so many manifestations of the um, affinity between Pepperdine and Israel, but today I, I came up with a new one as I was climbing the uh, mountains in my uh, rented car, and that is I think I spotted a lot of irrigation uh, through all the things like that, and that I had never really thought of it from that angle before, but uh, it, did, it struck me today. Um, you'll have to excuse me uh, in one respect, uh, I guess I prepared my remarks when today's panel had a slightly different title. Um, so the uh, title I prepared for was not how Israel has been has affected and been affected by international law, but more um, is, 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 is international law good or bad for Israel and how do Israelis think about it? So that's uh, the thought I had given uh, to this. Uh, 
I will um, start by talking about the ways that Israel benefits from international law. And to set up a discussion up here, I'll talk about um, the paradox, which is there are many ways in which Israel, uh, international law, one could not imagine an, an Israel as uh, prosperous, as culturally sound as it is today, going into the future without international law. Though it's certainly been my experience whenever I'm in Israel that um, lots and lots of Israelis have nothing good to say about international law. And I will try to explore why, why I think that's so. Um, let me start with a definition of uh, uh, law that I've refined over the years since my first semester at Harvard Law School. I think of law most fundamentally as a constraint on unilateral ad hoc action. The existence of law means that individuals or, nat or legal persons, or in the case of international law states, in a world of law cannot act without any legal constraint unilaterally. There may be other constraints, there may be economic constraints, there may be political constraints, but in a world without law, um, there's a lack of uh, formal legal constraint. Uh, what are those constraints? Well, they can be a set of substantive norms that constrain action. That's one way of looking at international law. Or it can be a set of procedural constraints, processes that one needs to go for before coming up with them. Or a third manifestation is, if not pr constraints uh, procedurally in the lawmaking process, then in the adjudication process um, as being what in international law is. If you look at it that way, I think you see that Israel benefits since its inception and going on to the future from international law in many very tangible ways. Um, the current economic well-being of the country um, is, you know, certainly has a lot to do with the ingenuity and creativity of its uh, people. But going out into the future, the image I have in my mind is a lot less of um, uh, kibbutzim and kibbutzniks rolling up their sleeves and making the desert bloom um, and has a lot more to do with protections of intellectual property rights born in Israel and the ability to gain the, the economic benefits of those around the law, all of which is a function, completely a function, of um, less and less national law now as an international legal regime for intellectual property protection. Um, uh, Israel benefits from the New York Convention and the uh, arbitration regime. Since 1995, it's been a member of the WTO, and, and benefits from uh, that uh, level playing field as far as international trade rights. And increasingly in the future, um, if there is to be a multilateral regime with respect to the internet, that will be enormously to the benefit of uh, Israel as well. Um, it's not just on the economic and cultural lane. When you think about it, uh, certainly the national security of Israel has a lot to do with the IDF. It has a lot to do with F-16s flying over its borders, but it has a lot to do with international law as well. There are many threats to the national security of Israel that Israel cannot attend to effectively unilaterally. So for example, the latest generation of multilateral treaties addressing terrorist financing, money laundering, all of those are designed in a preemptive way to protect um, uh, the national security of states uh, before a shot is even fired. And I would submit that Israel benefits from that regime about as much as any country in the world. Um, ironically, the n nuclear non-proliferation regime, as you see in the current confrontation with Iran, is one quiver in a large, uh, one arrow in a large quiver that benefits Israel in that current struggle. Um, so why, in my experience, is international law then so uh, very unpopular among Israelis, at least that's my experience in talking to Israelis. Um, I often have a conversation as, uh, uh, among Israelis in which, uh, at least on the surface, the person I'm talking to sounds like the ultimate realist. Um, the ultimate realist in the sense that they articulate views that sound something like there is no international law. International law is a veneer, a cover for what is ultimately power, and uh, Israel just has to act unilaterally and secure its own power base um, and, not, and not rely on international law. Um, but the further I pursue the conversation, my conclusion is um, many of the Israelis I talk to are not ultimately realists, despite what they say. That is, the ultimate realist doesn't believe in law. 
um, or a very limited application of law, especially international law. I don't find most Israelis are ultimately like that. What they object to, as I pursue it further, is they object to what they see as the biased application of international legal norms, usually to their detriment. And they object to specific international institutions, not the law itself, but the institutions. High on the list, of course, is the UN General Assembly, the UN Human Rights Council, the International Court of Justice, and most recently, um, the Goldstone Commission, uh, of which I'm sure we'll hear more later. Um, so uh, why is this? Um, well, let me say this. I've been studying international law for a very long time. And the way I would characterize it is I would say when you t think about nations and international law, it's somewhat like the way I think about law faculties around the world. They're all problematic and dysfunctional, but all in their own way. OK, so uh, there's, the more you look at it closely, even the most internationalist of states, the Netherlands, Belgium, they all have somewhat of a problematic relationship with international law when you look at it closely. Um, I would submit, however, that here's what I see the relationship of Israel and international law and the heart of the, uh, the problematic relationship. First, I think Israelis genuinely and appropriately view much of the body of international law, whether it be substantive or procedural, as being externally imposed upon them. Okay? Americans object to international law uh, a lot. Some Americans even see it as externally imposed. What I would say is it's very rare to ever find an instance in, in the current world in which any international law is externally imposed upon the United <coughs> States in the way it's imposed on Israel. How is it externally imposed? Well, take one classic area of international law, which is customary international law. Interna Israel has practically zero input into the development of customary international law. It's a small state. Its field of endeavors are relatively limited. And it's very hard to find examples of international tribunals or arbitration tribunals pointing to a practice of inter Israel as evidence of customary international law. Uh, I've attended multilateral treaty negotiations in which Israel is a, is a party. For the most part, Israel has very little ability to influence the text or direction of a multilateral treaty negotiation. It's pretty much an up or down matter for Israel's point of view. And sometimes staying out of the treaty regime is the way to go. Sometimes it's not feasible. And it's kind of a contract of adhesion. Third, if you look at the major lawmaking bodies in the world, Israel is systematically de denied a voice in them. Israel has never sat on the uh, Security Council of the United Nations, and it's hard to imagine any situation in the foreseeable future in which it would. Um, Israel has no judge on the ICJ. Um, uh, that's another way in which it seems externally imposed. And finally, um, Israel isn't alone in being a small country. But other small countries, take Belgium, for instance, are ager, able to leverage their membership in influential regional organizations like the European Union to magnify their voice so that many Belgians don't see international law as externally imposed because it's not only a Belgian voice that counts. It's an EU-wide voice. Um, Israel doesn't. Uh, what I would say uh, about Israel is Israel, in, in many international fora, is sort of virtually represented by the United States. Though most Israelis don't uh, fully appreciate that um, and, um, and still see uh, the norms created uh, uh, as being externally Im imposed. All right, so there's the sense of international law as being externally Im imposed that uh, always make the relationship between Israelis and international law a tense one or a problematic one. Let me mention one other. It's not only that international law is externally imposed. It's the widespread feeling among Israelis that even when international law or institutional, international institutions act in a manner that isn't deliberately biased against Israel, right? it's not every instance that the ICJ decides a case and there's actual bias. The Danish judge was biased against Israel. There's a second problem, and that is International law is created by actors, states, and organizations that don't understand Israel's predicament. Okay? If we analogize it to the criminal justice process, 
If what makes you accept a decision of a tribunal or a jury is that it was arrived at by a jury of your peers, at least, there's a widespread understanding in Israel that adjudication worldwide, lawmaking worldwide, is never taken by states that are its peers. And why is that? Well, there are very few states in the world that you can uh, name which have lived for decades with the perception that the threats against them are existential. Okay, that really is a separate situation. Um, there are few, uh, there are other countries in the world, but if you combine the two, that are states incorporating a historical tradition, a long historical tradition, which it perceives of one of gross persecution, gross victimization, and you combine that with a modern period of time in which the threats are existential. Um, and third, Israel is a state in which it's constantly in the position of being at the vanguard of the next form of warfare, okay? Whether it be suicide bombers or different uh, uh, forms of terrorism. If you talk to Israelis, um, they, they have the very cold comfort of feeling that finally the United States or finally Spain is experiencing what Israel experienced 20 years ago. Well, that's you know, very cold comfort because um, those states may have a different perception of, of things that Israel was doing uh, 20 years ago, but Israel's already moved on to the next period of this. And so the problem with international law from an Israeli perspective is there's this perennial lag in which it is perennially misunderstood. All right, I think that um, uh, sets up uh, a conversation with my uh, colleagues. And after one more comment, let me turn it over to them. My last comment is this. Um, I do not see a full uh, normalization of Israel's situation in the world. Um, requires not only a satisfactory solution to a conflict with Palestinians and neighbors and so forth, but ultimately I don't see a full normalization of Israel's situation in the world until Israel comes to a uh, rapprochement or a, um, uh, a different relationship with international law in general. Um, let me turn it over then to either Avi or Bruce. Sure. Well, first of all, I apologize for being a little late. I was supposed to be the moderator. Um, I should not have eaten the pastrami last night. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but let me, um, let me talk very briefly since we have guests. I'm Bruce Seinhorn. I have the honor of being a professor here at the Pepperdine Law School uh, uh, of international law, international human rights law, and the laws of war, as well as asylum and refugee law. Uh, I was a federal judge for 17 years, and prior to that, the chief of litigation for the Nazi war crimes unit of the Department of Justice. So I've been dealing with a lot of... Uh, international issues for a long time, longer than many of you have been alive. And um, I want to talk a little bit about international organizational problems that Israel has faced. Some of them were touched on by my colleague, Professor Dubinsky, who, by the way, if he hasn't introduced himself, is a tenured professor of law at Wayne State University Law School in Detroit. He has also been the associate director of the Center for International Human Rights at the Yale Law School, and he has also been a visiting professor at Bar Ilan University in Israel, Georgetown University in Washington, and he was a big time lawyer with uh, the Wilmer Hale firm. And we're honored to have him. And we also have with us Professor Avi Bell um, to his, uh, to Professor Dubinsky's right and your left. That's not an ideological statement. Professor Bell is professor. Actually, actually it might be. <laughs> it, I, I make no statements. I wait to judge. But. Uh, <laughs> professor Bell is a professor of law at the University of San Diego and also at Bar Ilan University. He is a specialist on, among other things, international law. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago and of Harvard University, and he clerked for Justice uh, Shashin of the Israeli Supreme Court, the High Court of Justice. He also, uh, for many of us who are Zionists, honored us by serving as a sergeant major in reserve paratrooper units of the Israeli Defense Forces. 
so I'm honored to be with them. Uh, as to the international organizational problems that Israel faces, let me begin with what I perceive to be a constant problem that Israel faces in the international law field as implemented through international bodies that either promote laws, positive laws of international law, customary rules of international law, or the kind of policies that one day may, in some cases, unfortunately, emerge as rules of international law, either positive or customary, either written or unwritten. And that is that I think that there are many, if not most, countries in the world who operate through international organizations who are not comfortable with Israel as a major regional power in the Middle East. I think that Israel has become much more of a self-sustaining and successful democratic state since 1967. It is a state to be reckoned with on a number of levels, not just politically and militarily, but also economically and educationally. It has made the desert bloom and defended itself with great strength. And despite it, the existential threats to Israel, uh, it always tends to emerge uh, scarred, bloodied, uh, but still successful. And I think that many nations, if not most nations in the world, take exception to that, or are at least uncomfortable with that. Uh, historically, you know, Jews have been victims, and the fact that Jews are now asserting themselves as leaders in the international field, I think, have rattled the, the chains of, uh, of many nations and international bodies, and have also brought out some stereotypes regarding uh, Jews that uh, may have been uh, under the surface. Having said that, there are some very specific problems that Israel has faced from 2008 through 2009, the United Nations General Assembly, which is the usually uh, most Israel body and is the quasi-legislative body of the UN, but one that tends to promote uh, non-binding resolutions, uh, spent an extraordinary and disproportionate amount of its time focusing on the state of Israel and on its struggle with Palestinian militants. 20 resolutions were passed that were blatantly anti-Israel in that one year period. No other country has experienced that disproportionate criticism, uh, including Cuba, including China, including uh, a number of states that still are not definable as democracies. Uh, also, of the 10 emergency special sessions called by the General Assembly, six of those 10 have been about Israel. And to give you an idea of how disproportionate that is, no emergency sessions have ever been held on the Rwandan genocide, on the ethnic cleansing in the former Yugoslavia, or on two decades of atrocities in the Sudan. Israel also has suffered because for many, many years, it was blocked from being a member of any of the regional groups in the UN through which Israel could join major bodies of the UN. The Asian regional group has constantly refused under Arab pressure to allow Israel into its midst, even though Israel is in Asia. The Israelis sought admission into the Western and Others group, and in May 2000 it was granted admission, but it wasn't granted admission in the Geneva organizations of the UN, which means that as to all UN organizations which have their seat in Geneva, and there are many, the Israel is not allowed to participate as members of those organizations. It's limited and restricted uh, to the New York organizations. And if you look at the most positive development in the situation with Israel vis-a-vis -vis international bodies, it is that the UN's second committee, the Economic and Financial Committee, adopted uh, an Israel-initiated draft resolution dealing with agricultural technology and development. Now, Israel is a leader in that field. Israel is the world leader, as was briefly discussed last night, in water resource preservation and development. But the idea that the only resolution that has ever been adopted from Israel is one dealing with agriculture, when Israel is a specialist on the fight against terrorism 
and the preservation of democracy and the rights of women in the Middle East, as well as the rights of gays in the Middle East, the rights of Baha'is in the Middle East, the rights of Vietnamese and Sudanese refugees, many of whom have found homes in Israel, is appalling. And of course, the low of lows in recent times was the 2001 UN World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa, where resolutions were passed calling Israel a racist state and calling Israel an apartheid state. Uh, and uh, over time, many UN leaders, many UN leaders have referred to Israel as, um, as a Nazi-like state, which is a particularly insulting uh, ad hominem against a state that rose from the ashes of the Shoah, the Holocaust. Uh, and uh, Professor Bell may want to talk about this particular issue but the UN Human Rights Council, which has succeeded as an organization from the UN Rights Commission, Human Rights Commission, has been particularly preoccupied with Israel. Uh, the uh, UN Human Rights Council has been proposed as being the only nation that is part of its permanent agenda. Not the Sudan, not China, not Cuba. Uh, one especially outrageous report connected with the council was issued by the special rapporteur, John de Gard, which was entitled The Human Rights Situation in Palestine and Other Occupied Arab Territories. And that report went so far as to justify, justify the, uh, the violence of Palestinian terrorists, blaming Israel for their actions and comparing them to the Europeans, that is the Palestinian extremists, comparing them to the Europeans who resisted Nazi occupation and asserted that acts of terror against military occupation must be seen in a historic context. Comparing those extremists to the Jews who fought in the Warsaw Ghetto and Jewish partisans who fought in the forests of Eastern Europe is, uh, is blood libel. And that it be said in current times is both a, an act of ignorance and bigotry. Finally, just let me say that all of this, all of these things, contributes to the fact that international organizations that promulgate policies that may one day be part of international law are clearly uncomfortable with Israel's emergence as a major power in the Middle East and as the only democracy in that part of the world. And I submit that those nations are concerned because despite all of the threats and violence perpetuated against Israel, it has emerged as a liberal democracy which treats all of its citizens with relative dignity. And when there are errors, and there are in the way minorities and Israeli Arabs and dissidents are treated in Israel, actually engages in investigations of its own officials, as anyone who reads the newspaper can see. So part of the problem, part of the major problem with Israel in international law is the way international law is perceived and implemented by organizations that need to go back to kindergarten and start their education all over again. Or as my, my mother would say, they need a mommy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I, I, I agree with much of what has been said, but in order to try to open things up, I'm going to try to find the points of disagreement and exaggerate them a little bit. Um, I want to actually start at the very beginning where, um, where uh, Professor Dubinsky started with uh, the definition of international law. And uh, that, that's where I disagree, and I think that much of our disagreement stems from that beginning. Um, the definition that Paul gave was international law as a restraint on states' behavior. Now, I, I think that's incorrect on a variety of levels. Uh, first of all, technically, the, the, the way I would define international law is a little bit different. International law is the agreed upon rules among states by agreed upon procedures. Now, these agreed upon rules may or may not end up restraining behavior. Oftentimes, as we know, they don't. All right, so, um, uh, one of the examples that Paul brought to show how international law is good for Israel is he described a number of recent t treaties, I guess they're no longer so recent, they're about 10 years old, uh, regarding terrorism, the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism and the International Convention for the Suppression of Terrorist Bombings from 1999. 
And these are, these create international law that, if implemented, would be very useful to Israel. And in fact, they were followed on by um, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1373 from 2001, all of which bar various kinds of support for terrorist organizations. But nevertheless, um, the states of Europe, the United States indirectly fund uh, Hamas, which is a terrorist organization currently in charge of Gaza, by providing funds to the Palestinian Authority, which in turn turns them over to Hamas in Gaza, uh, quite openly. Right? Um, nonetheless, um, all of the states of Europe and the United States support the government of Lebanon, which has incorporated within it a terrorist party called Hezbollah. Right? Um, it's clearly in violation of Security Council Resolution 1373. These states are clearly violating their obligations under the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism. But the fact that the rules exist do not in and of themselves restrain behavior. And I, I think that's an important thing to, to bear in mind. So when, um, as, as, um, as Paul proceeded, he described what um, he saw as the Israeli skepticism about international law, which I, I, I think he modified to skepticism about institutions um, and interpretation, right, which I think is, is closer, because I actually think, unfortunately, um, many Israelis share what I would call the naive view of international law as actually restraining behavior. And for that reason, many Israelis have a false confidence in the rules and power of international law. Now, um, when, as, as you described some of the examples of why it is that you think that Israel has fear of the institutions, you described the way the institutions make laws. Now, I, by my understanding, this is incorrect. Uh, international law, again, is the agreed upon rules among states. Um, it is true that Israel has little ability when a multilateral treaty is negotiated to influence the language in it. But like all international law, it has the option of being in or out. That's everyone's option. Um, the problem with the institutions is not that they're creating rules that are bad for Israel. I actually think that the, the, the rules that we have out there are not bad at all. The, one of them we just mentioned, the uh, rules regarding support for terrorism, um, the laws of war. They're wonderful rules. The problem is not that the rules themselves are bad, um, but that the institutions and advocates for these rules have decided that the rules are only selectively important. That is, they don't seem to remember them when it requires restraints on behavior that is d bad for Israel. And they don't seem to remember what the rules say when they criticize Israel for behavior that is lawful according to these rules. Um, now, I understand the um, reluctance to view these critics as acting in bad faith. And so much of the discussion rather assumes good faith. You say, for example, many of these actors don't understand Israel's predicament. But I, I think that's just not, not plausible as an interpretation of, of the behavior. Um, I, let's, uh, let's take, for example, when you're talking about uh, the terror financing, as I said, one, what, what the example was perhaps Spain after uh, the experiencing the bombings in Madrid or um, the UK after, um, a, um, after not only the, 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 the decades of Irish terrorist attacks, but also the more recent uh, um, uh, Al-Qaeda attacks would have an, um, an understanding, but that's, I, I'm sure they do understand, but yet what we, will we still see exactly the same behavior. The, the terrorist financing provisions of international law are understood by UN institutions selectively to apply only to Al-Qaeda and to none others, notwithstanding 
uh, the definitions you have of, of terror acts in the International Convention for the Suppression of uh, Terrorist Financing, of Financing of Terror. Um, and there's, notwithstanding the understanding now of what's going on, you don't see a lot of change in behavior. It's the, ch the behavior is not, in other words, uh, motivated by a failure to understand. It is under, it, it's perfectly well understood. It is simply hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is, I think we should all recognize, part of the language of international affairs. Um, when, um, when European states endorse what, is clear, what was clearly a violation of the rules of war of, of jus ad bellum in attacking Yugoslavia before Kosovo for what most states believed was a very good cause, um, they evidenced a very healthy skepticism of the naked rules of international law and an embrace of the needs of states to be able to do those things that they have to do as understood by um, their concepts of justice in order to defend basic interests. When, it, when they see similar situations um, around Israel, not only do they forget that, the, that these concepts of justice exist, they even forget what the rules mean. So that when in uh, 2006, a terrorist group illegally located in Lebanon attacked Israel, all of a sudden the, the laws of Yusuf Bellum transformed for all these same European states that had earlier endorsed a very broad view of the right of states to engage in military action uh, against Yugoslavia to, in, in essence, help Kosovo secede, um, had all, all of a sudden discovered um, a problem in Israel exercising force against a terrorist group that was Ill illegally located in Lebanon and illegally using force against Israel. Now is that, again, is this, is this good faith? Is this a failure to understand? I don't think there's any failure to understand here. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of what goes on here um, is, uh, is well-defined and well-understood hypocrisy, distortion of the rules, and distortion of the facts. And so um, uh, uh, both of you mentioned uh, Israel is not on the Security Council, is unlikely ever to be. Uh, Bruce mentioned at length that this was because Israel was not admitted, was the only state not admitted in the UN system to a regional grouping. Um, eventually Israel was admitted to a regional grouping. The regional grouping was basically the European group. The European group, however, at the insistence of France and several under other countries, admitted Israel only as a second class member. And as a second class member, one of the conditions was not only that Israel could not participate in the Geneva institutions, one of it was that Israel could not put forward its candidacy for a specified period of time for the Security Council. Um, and now, this is, not a, this is not a condition put forward by the 56 states that are the 56 Muslim states in the United Nations. It was not a condition put forward by the two dozen Arab League states in the United Nations. This was France. This was um, a Western European democratic state that felt that there was an important principle to uphold in violating Article I of the UN Charter and denying Israel the sovereign equality that is extended to every other state in the UN system. Now, is this lack of understanding? No, this is not lack of understanding. Um, when um, when uh, uh, European states, you know, the Human Rights Council, and or organizations like, the, like Human Rights Watch criticize Israel for using um, white phosphorus weaponry in the recent war in Gaza. Um, were they unaware that every single NATO country uses white phosphorus? Were they unaware that white phosphorus was used in urban warfare in the Second Gulf War? Were they unaware that it was actually used much more aggressively in, by NATO troops in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, than was used in, uh, in, by Israel during the, the Gaza war. I, I went online during the last summer to look at Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch had criticized Israel's use of white phosphorus. So I went online to see um, during the summer 
how many times they'd mentioned white phosphorus in any reports on their website. So I found 23 mentions of white phosphorus. 22 of them had to do with Israel. One of them had to do with the use of white phosphorus in a meatpacking plant by, as in part of an industrial process. Right? They seem to have overlooked, and by the way, there's a huge uh, scandal in Italy about uh, alleged NATO uh, uh, illegal use of white phosphorus by NATO forces in Fallujah, in Iraq, where it was contrary to Israel's practice, actually used as an anti-personnel weapon, which is then, then plausibly illegal. Um, did Human Rights Watch not notice this? Did they not know that white phosphorus is legal, is used by everyone, and that the controversy over particular uses um, is much greater over others? I, I don't think that's plausible. Now, when, um, I was asked over the summer to look at, somebody asked me to give them their evaluation of uh, a Human Rights Watch report concerning the fighting in Jenin in 2002. And so it's a really interesting report. It's, it's, uh, it's about 60 pages long. It describes um, urban warfare in which there were roughly 56 um, Palestinian casualties and about 20 Israeli casualties. Um, of the 56, roughly half were combatants. The Human Rights Watch identified 22 civilians, Palestinian civilians, who it said uh, were killed in the course of the fighting. And then you go through, and every single one, it claims that every single one of the Palestinian civilians killed was a violation of the rules of war. That is, in every single case, there was urban warfare, and every single civilian death was a war crime. Now, frankly, that's not plausible. Right? That's just not plausible. Um, I've, so I've seen a figure that uh, roughly half of all war deaths since, uh, since World War II are civilians, which sounds roughly right. It is an unfortunate fact of war, and it is a, a legal fact of war, um, that when states use force, it is legal to what, do what we sterilely call collateral damage. That is, to aim at military targets knowing that civilians will die, knowing that the innocents will die. This is a feature of legal warfare. Uh, right now, as we speak, American troops are operating with, with other NATO troops. Um, in, um, in a village in, in Afghanistan, Marja, please excuse me if I'm mispronouncing it. Um, this morning there was a report that 12 civilians were killed by uh, an errant bomb. Right? Um, I have my doubts that we'll see a Human Rights Watch report uh, 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 stating that, uh, that this was a war crime. I have my doubts that there will be a Human Rights Council uh, demand for an investigation. I have my doubts that there will be a Human Rights Council investigation insisting that the civilians were deliberately targeted. Right? The, the currency of the debate here is, frankly, is lies. Right? It is misstatement, deliberate misstatements of fact, deliberate misstatements of law. And so um, when, Israel, when Israel distrusts the institutions, and distrusts the self-described interpreters and advocates, it is mistrusting them not because of the production of rules or the content of the rules. It is mistrusting them because they are lying in the way these rules are used and in what has happened. Now, uh, this brings me to my very last point because I see that we've, uh, I've exhausted my time, um, which is I think that this, the, the real issue for those, those of you, I don't happen to be one of them, but for those of you who share the naive view of international law, that international law actually in these kinds of situations can serve as a restraint on behavior, the challenge is for you. Because by allowing lies like this and misinterpretations like this to stand unchallenged, you're in essence creating a situation where people ultimately will hold the rules themselves, themselves in disregard. And if, if the rules ultimately mean Nothing more than Israel is, the Jewish state is always wrong, everybody else is always right, then these rules will not be held with, to, in respect. That's, that's, that is the bottom line of it. And so um, if you want these rules to be respected, then it is more important for you than for I to call out those individuals who are distorting their content and their application and to call them to task. 
right. thank you. I know, you're welcome, man. and uh, thank you both for very articulate comments. I know Professor Dubinsky wanted to respond, and I will therefore cede him the floor. Okay, I think um, Avi and I have two basic disagreements, so I want to crystallize uh, what I see that they are. Uh, before I, I do that, though, let me say, I think in the interest of liveliness and contrast, um, Avi has uh, uh, made our positions seem more polar than they are. I'm not saying that there is uh, not bias in the world. I'm not, not saying that there isn't uh, tangible uh, instances of hypocrisy and corruption and so forth. I'm trying to bring to light what I think is an aspect of international law formation that people talk less about because it's more subtle. And that, part, that one is the extent to which, listen, the rules of international law are, are certainly not well suited or designed with Israel in mind. Um, and so you're going to find many that don't suit a country uh, in its, Israel's predicament. Our first major disagreement is, is this. Um, uh, I, I, I think it's hard to understand Israel's predicament. Uh, I think uh, it's hard to understand unless you've lived there for any period of time. I periodically visit, and I don't think I completely understand it. Sure, you can watch the television and watch rockets go from Gaza to a, to a settlement in Israel, and you can try to empathize with what it's like uh, for those children in that settlement, but what you're missing, what you don't understand is, uh, what I didn't understand is, for many Israelis, that is internalized or understood as an existential threat. Okay? Objectively speaking, I think it's not an existential threat, uh, but it calls to mind for many Israelis a long history of existential threats. And so the fact that there are bombs in London, a long period of time of bombs in Lon London or Madrid and so forth, doesn't necessarily mean that people are fully understanding Israel's predicament because those are not existential threats and they're not understood to be existential threats. Um, the, se the second, I think, major point of disagreement is uh, I would disagree with obvious uh, characterization of the uh, NATO bombing of uh, Yugoslavia in, in connection with Kosovo. That was not understood by Europeans in the way that uh, Europeans would dramatically contrast with Israeli action which they would characterize as unilateral. Now, whether you accept it or not, most Europeans understood the bombing of Yugoslavia as fully consistent with international law, fully consistent with an understanding of humanitarian intervention as evolving, and they, as a group of states, participating in that customary international law formation. They did not understand it to be lawless, and they would underline that fact by uh, another important matter, which is when that bombing was challenged in the International Court of Justice, those states accepted the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to rule on that. So um, uh, the second point of, of disagreement, is, I guess as I would characterize it, is um, other states which um, Avi might characterize their behavior as similar to Israel, I would say they do not understand the way they're going about things as fundamentally sim similar to Israel at all. Can we have, uh, let, let's have Bruce and then Avi respond, and then we'll take questions. I, 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 you know what? I'm going to cede to Professor Bell because I really want the students and the audience to uh, okay. have some time for questions. Professor Bell, did you want to respond to the respondent? Uh, I do. I, 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 I would. Um, let me, there, there were two points there, so I'm just going to address them each in turn. Um, the first one, uh, let me actually pick out on, on the example that you stated. The, uh, do Israelis view uh, rockets launched from Gaza as an existential threat? No, I don't think they do, actually, and I don't think it matters. That is, uh, Israel's rights to defend itself are not, res are not restricted to existential threats. Mm -hmm. Did the 9-11 um, did the attacks in the United States pose a threat to the very existence of the United States? No, they did not. No. Did that mean the United States did not have a right to defend itself by using a, a, a vast amount of force in Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda? Of course it didn't mean. The United States had the right to exercise in self-defense, which was recognized um, uh, by most countries in the world um, and was recognized by the Security Council. Now, 
it doesn't, the, the, the rules on self-defense don't require that every threat be existential before uh, threats, before states may respond. Now there are, there are possibilities of rockets, rocket attacks on Israel which actually would be existential threats. If they were emanating from the West Bank, they would shut down every single uh, t transportation artery in Israel and that becomes, that would become an existential threat. The, the ability to project is important. The same thing would be true, by the way, of the United States. The fact if 9-11 uh, if attacks, type attacks were re repeated every week, then this could become an existential threat to the United States. It would be impossible to carry on uh, a normal life in commerce in the United States. But it's, I don't think that the problem here, again, this is not this vastly different. It's not that Israelis have an exaggerated sense of what is happening to them or that other people are failing to understand the peculiar psychology of Israel. No, I think that the Israelis are uh, responding the way most other states would respond, oftentimes more mildly, um, both psychologically and then politically. Now, I think the second comment that you made, that it's, it's quite true that, you, that the European states do honestly pro, um, uh, project their behavior even when it's clearly unlawful as lawful, and criticize Israeli behavior clearly lawful as unlawful. Um, the, the, there, these professions are made repeatedly, and it is quite true that, they'll, that you will not see European acknowledgments generally of the unlawfulness of their behavior. You will not see them acknowledging that they are violating, for example, the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism. Right? Um, that said, does that mean that these are honestly held views by each one of these people, that if they only had a greater understanding of things that they would behave better? I, I, there's, there's a point at which um, when so, willful refusal to see the evidence that is in front of you is in, the equivalent of willful lying. Right? If there are no set of facts that would ever make you acknowledge the truth, then you are a liar. Right? And I don't know if there's any material difference between the person who honestly believes in all the lies that he says and will never ever be convinced of the truth and the person who knows that he is lying. Okay. Tessa Alfred, you want to add, uh, solicit yeah. questions? Uh, questions, yep. Looking to the future, a lot of people speculate that, uh, especially in light of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's announcement that they're a nuclear state now, uh, many people speculate that if there's going to be an attack on Iran, uh, 2010 is going to be the year in which it happens, either probably from Israel or perhaps from the United States. But yet, a, I think that a strict reading of the UN Charter and international law would render that illegal. Now, A, is that accurate? Would you agree? And if it is, then when it comes to Israel, is international law really relevant and does it really matter? For, I don't know, well, ver very it. briefly, you know, the, I think it is reasonable to interpret the, uh, the legal rules regarding self-defense as including the right of states, both collectively and individually, to engage in measures that some co other countries might regard as too preemptive, but I would regard as in a very reasonable anticipation of an immediate, or as my colleagues say, existential threat to the existence of the state that is acting in self-defense. One can make the argument, I would make the argument, forget the one can make, I would make the argument that the state of Israel, if it acted against Iran, to uh, put an end to its nuclear ambitions would be acting in anticipation of at least something that is close to an immediate uh, danger to its existence. Nuclear weapons are the greatest single threat in the world today. The proliferation of nuclear weapons to non-state actors, terrorist actors, uh, is an existential threat to all of us. Uh, and I think that if Israel acted, it would be in an accordance with international law. Now, as a matter of policy, uh, we should encourage debate about whether Israel should act, and I think the reason Israel hasn't is because of the solicitations of the United States. But I think if Israel did act on a legal level, I think it would have the right to do so. One more question. Um, but um, my husband and I 
this past year we lived in Jerusalem, and it was a wonderful experience. We had a great privilege. But um, we were avid Zionists before we went to Israel, and that's really you know, what inspired us to go. But after our year of living there, um, it tremendously changed my way of looking at things. And as we're having this like existential debate about how the Israelis perceive things, um, you know, when you mentioned bombings in Madrid and London versus um, attacks in Israel, it's, when you're in Israel, you understand when you're speaking with Israelis and living with Israelis, you know, it's how the world perceives them. And it's so devastating and hurting to Israelis when here they'll have this terrible attack, something will happen, and the world points to them and says, it's your fault. There's no empathy, there's no sympathy, there's no, there's not even any acknowledgement for a mother losing her child. It's such a political bali gun, it's such a disaster over there that people have lost even their human emotions towards is Israel and its cause. And any Zionist worldwide, there's this absolute, I mean, I can't even, I'm such a crazy Zionist, and I, I absolutely love it. And I've even, I've, it's sad because I've lost the ability, I felt like my year in Israel, I became so hardened against people who are anti-Zionist because I would watch these things and watch these people and hear these stories of mothers losing children right in their arms and having worldwide organizations say, too bad, you know, maybe you guys shouldn't have done what you did. And it's, it's so unfortunate and I just don't know how Israel is going to, you know, move forward in this positive way that everyone's putting all this pressure on them and having no sympathy for them. How is Israel supposed to uh, get in line, you know, with all these international uh, requests when we don't even have the humanistic emotions towards them, them as people, them as survivors of the Holocaust. I mean, it's like Israel has lost this whole swipe. No one goes yeah. back anywhere at all. Can you get one response to that? Well, I, I guess I agree with a lot of you said. I, I, I think actually one of the biggest mistakes in particular with uh, Europe's relationship with uh, Israel has been the failure of civil society uh, to express any uh, level of human solidarity with his, uh, Israeli suffering for, politi for political reasons, for domestic political reasons. And um, it would mean a lot. It would bridge a lot of the gap uh, in doing that. You see it very, very rarely. And I think your sense of, uh, of uh, uh, Israeli feelings of alienation in that regard has certainly been my experience. Okay, let's stop there if we can and thank our panelists.